Thank you. Um, so first of all, to introduce ourselves, um, introduce myself. My name is Anna Hermelin. I'm a partner with the law firm Ashurst. I always apologize for being a lawyer. Um, you saw my colleague earlier, Shamal Graham, um, who was giving uh, the talk just before lunch. Um, I'm really delighted and honored to be here for this panel. The, this is why I, I do what I do. Um, I started work in infrastructure in Europe too many years ago, um, so please don't count the white hair. Um, but really, this is why I did it. You know, you could be a could be an M and A lawyer, a tax lawyer, but I thought, no, I want to do something tangible that really impacts the communities and that gets me out of bed every morning. And I've had the privilege to start that in Europe. Then I spent many years in Asia where infrastructure development was all about bringing equity to communities across a number of different countries there. And then for the last six years and, and hopefully onward, um, have had the um, honor to be working on a number of projects across California um, for LA Metro, Sandag, um, VTA, and a number of different public agencies. So delighted to be here with the panel, really excited for the conversation. Um, so maybe we can start with Erin. Introduce yourself. Thank you, Anna. I really appreciate um, just being here uh, on this panel and with, with all these amazing people and all of you who are doing all these incredible things um, in the city and beyond. My name is Erin Wimberly, and I use the she suite of pronouns. Um, I, uh, my official title with uh, CalSART is Equity and Community Engagement uh, Project Manager. And basically what I do is I keep track of all of the equity um, pieces that go into the design of a lot of the programs and projects that we design and mainly we're doing um, third-party administration of block grants. Um, CalSART is a global uh, nonprofit. We've got a MOU that a lot of uh, nations are signing on to and then we've got a number of initiatives uh, which are um, buses, trucks, light duty and then the team that I'm on which is fuels and infrastructure. So much, Erin. Alice. Alice Rodriguez, um, Deputy Director um, of External Affairs for the California High Speed Rail Authority. Um, I also use the she suite of pronouns. I am a Latina and I am a proud Californian. I've spent all of my growing up years, um, all of my professional career here in California. I've had the great honor of being in state government uh, for close to 20 years now. I think I'm at 18. Um, I did also work in the private sector, have had a little bit of experience there, um, so, but mostly in the public sector, so I'm proud to represent the authority and what I think is an amazing project and look forward to the discussion. Hello there, yeah, my name is Donald Kennedy and thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm greatly appreciative to be part of the conversation and what it is is I work with students. So I'm a CTE and Career Pathways Coordinator and it's trying to make I'm trying to connect a lot of the conversations and a lot of things that you guys are doing uh, to the future. So, and it was really difficult following that last guy, Ted. <laughs> I mean, this, this is a curse coming up here after Ted. Thanks very much, Donald. Um, so maybe we can start, we have the good fortune at the moment in America to have uh, incredible amounts of infrastructure investment available at, at federal, state at level. Um, and a number of programs have been established, some of those require, requiring certain amounts of investments in the community. But to Ted's point earlier, how do we really engage with the needs of historically undisturbed communities, particularly in the planning stages and, and decision making? Alice, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, you know, I think, <clears throat> I know it's cliche to say it starts at the top, but even before that, I think what it really starts with is a historical knowledge and understanding of what we got right in the past, building mega infrastructure, but also what we could improve on. And I think there's a lot that we can improve on. Um, incorporating communities, um, to Ted's point, you know, not just getting their consensus, or not just getting their buy-in, but actually getting them a seat at the table and getting them a voice and an opportunity um, to participate in what infrastructure looks like for all. Um, the, and then go back, going back to my, my original thought about it starts at the top is you think about it from a, an executive level, from that C-suite level, you really have to get leadership that says, we want to do things differently. I see and I value voices from different communities. I think at the, at the start, at the gate, you look at um, 
the high speed rail authority's executive management team is more than 50% female. I don't know a lot of state agencies um, or other private uh, entities that maybe can claim that. I'm sure there are some, and I applaud those. Um, but that is where you start to see start to see the change at the table that are making those big decisions, um, that are then recruiting others to come on board, and that allows for an opportunity of those those varied voices um, to be a part of infrastructure that will then serve the all of the community. Um, and I think that's like I said, we also have a uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion task force. Um, again, thinking about this is something that our executive management created is um, is under the the uh, management of my chief, my chief of uh, strategic communications, um, because we want to make sure that it's not just internally something that we think about internally and is communicated with our own staff, but that that represents something that we can do in a public setting as well, and that it, that colors all of those. Um, outreach events that we do and the strategies that we employ in communications, whether they be on social media or in print media um, and, and community meetings, things like that. Um, so I think understanding and having that leadership that says, yes, that's a value that we want to instill or we want to have at our agency, it has to begin there um, at, the, at, the top, at the top levels. You. And I think, as you say as well, it's about permeating through everything rather than just uh, sort of in a box. This is one decision, but across the board in all the decision making at all the tables. Donald, maybe I can no, ask you. It, it's like you said, it's very important about having having people involved in the conversation and involved in the process. Um, we have to advocate from a school district's perspective, we have to advocate on behalf of the students and behalf of the communities. And we have to get them involved, whether it's the environment or whether it's uh, jobs, whether it's careers, whether it's exposure. But some of, it's really interesting because we're right here in downtown LA and two miles this direction, you know, in Boyle Heights and East LA, there were infrastructure projects that really adversely affected communities that cut through the middle of entire communities that bisected neighborhoods and families, um, but they weren't involved in the conversation at the time. And it's really integral that we connect people to the information about the advocacy, about advocating for themselves. We've got people from the ports, and the ports, we know that they're huge polluters. Um, and our students, you know, and our communities are part of, you know, the trains and the trucks. We see them all going by. Um, but that's what they're breathing in. So we have to be involved in the conversation. Uh, communities need to be able to advocate for themselves, whether it's for the environment or whether it's uh, for careers. You know, we'll talk on that a little bit later. Thank you very much. And uh, one thing you said there strikes me, if you think about some of the communities and the historical wrongs that you were uh, mentioning, Alice, if you think about how many schools um, have a, a big road between the school and, and the homes where the, pe the children are living that need to get to those and sort of really dissecting and, and splitting the communities and about trying to bring them, th bring them together. Yeah, and whether they're an afterthought, whether, um, I mean, you can look around if there's anybody left in here, but how many people commute and how many people commute by schools all the time and whether the schools and communities and, you know, students and people and <laughs> families, whether they're part of the conversation or whether you're just kind of bypassing them to go places, but being part of the conversation yeah, and the planning. Thanks, Donald. Erin, um, maybe you can get your insights. Yeah, I, I'd like to just kind of like touch on two of, the, two of the things that both Alice and Donald talked about, which is like community engagement. And sometimes it's like a little bit hard to get that that input if we haven't built capacity for people to actually even give input, right? So like um, people need something to react to. They need to be able to see your vision and what it is you really wanna do and how their input is actually going to impact what's going on, right? So that's one of the things that kind of came up for me. Um, also just like keeping in front of us like what that vision is. So Alice, you talked about having like these cohorts of people who are focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so in the programs that we run, um, Energize, which is like medium and heavy duty infrastructure, we have this huge problem where people are like, I'm a turnkey consultant, 
Um, I know that equity is important, but I don't know who is the community and how do I engage them, right? So keeping um, those groups who kind of have like an eagle eye for, for what that really looks like, what it can look like, and making sure that you're always keeping them at the forefront, I think is like a really good way to make sure that we can like all be moving toward, you know, the same goal, which is like making California, LA, the world more accessible and in a clean way, um, but then also like just kind of like feeding people or gi giving them uh, setting them up for success by giving them a, a, enough information to actually react to. Um, and then I think just really quickly, I know we're short on time, but the, the last thing I also kind of want to touch on is, um, and, and I'm sure, Donald, you probably get really specific with students. You know, like when you talk to, to the youth, they're like, um, about career, their career choice and what they want to do and what they want to be. You know, it's very specific. So I think in a lot of our community engagement, that we're doing and in a lot of our infrastructure projects, we have to get specific. We say equity, okay, great, what does that mean? We say community engagement, okay, great, what does that mean? Just like our friend Ted said, like you have to have numbers behind it, otherwise you don't know where you're starting, you don't know where you're going. So um, those are kind of the three things that came up um, when y'all were, were talking that I just wanted to kind of touch on. Thanks very much, and I mean, I think one of the points you really touch on is Ultimately, it's the why the projects are being done. The projects aren't being done to spend the grant money or being done to be delivered on time and on budget. Those are really things you want to happen. But the why is really to deliver to the community a piece of infrastructure that, that will make a difference and, and increase equity. Um, I think there's a certain irony, Dar Donald, that we have two Europeans bookending the panel here. But I, I think that has been you know, the lesson from Europe over many years is really focusing transportation infrastructure and the built environment to bringing the communities together and being something for all. Um, I know you mentioned that in, in some of the prep as well. No, I think that's very important, like the, 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 the voice, but the concreteness of it and also how it might either benefit or might adversely affect a community. Um, a lot of what I do is whether it's gonna equate to jobs or apprenticeships or internships or whether it's going to be, or access to transportation, or um, the access to transportation is is huge. It, it, it gives people the opportunity to, well, to, to, to go places, to do things, to, but especially as far as work. There's been numerous instances where kids, you know, look at, they go online and they look like, oh, wow, I just can't get there. It would take me. <laughs> You know, there is a fantastic opportunity in this place, but, you know, working together to try and solve it. Thanks, Donald. So, Alice, maybe we can say on that, that point that Donald was raising in terms of moving from decision-making and planning into actual delivery, and how do we increase the contracting opportunities, but also job participation from all the communities to get that diverse voice at the table right the way through the project delivery? Yeah, that's a great question and definitely one of the elements, um, employment and, and looking at jobs in general. Um, you know, we have design, we have, you know, the construction, the physical elements of it. Um, there's so many, there's so many elements about how we want to look through the DEI lens at our project. Um, but if we want to talk specifically about, about um, procurements or contracting or jobs, um, there's a couple of efforts that we have. I'll start with the student one. Um, we have a student outreach program. We want to try to get to the youth early uh, for numbers of reasons. One, there might be some bit of a selfishness. We want to get them educated so that we get their buy and we want to hear how they, what they think of the, of the rail and get them excited about it. But also we're training the workforce of the future and getting them excited about careers in transportation. We're going to need a lot of them to help us continue to design and to build as the years um, move, as this project moves forward and through the years, we're going to need that workforce. Um, but we know um, just through some research studies that, that careers in transportation are not necessarily ones that everyone's just driving to get at. Um, so we, well, how do we do our part to do that and whether we get engaged in, in getting kids excited about STEM learning, um, getting into grade school, into colleges. Um, to get them engaged in the project, but also looking at in the trades as well because not all of those children are going to go right into a college track and do those professional services in a consulting firm as an A&E uh, work, what have you. So we're working with uh, the trades. Uh, I know we have a workforce training center that just graduated its 12th cohort in Selma, which is right in the heart of where our construction is in the Central Valley. 
um, we're partnered with them to start getting that pipeline ready for residents that are in that economically diverse and economically impacted um, communities in the Central Valley that are having a true benefit from this project. Um, and those are wealth creating jobs. Those are jobs that really create a middle class for America that, that, that really then build the next generation to give them the next up, the biggest neck, you know, the next biggest opportunity to move forward in their careers or in their, in their future. So I think that's where, those are just some of the examples where we're really trying to make a difference um, and reaching out, we feel a sense of responsibility to do that with such a mega project like high speed rail. And then of course, growing that as we move into other project sections as well. Thanks, Alice. Yeah, I, I tell my middle schooler his job is to sell um, engineering jobs and, yeah. and <laughs> sell transit to all his friends. Um, Donald, maybe I can turn to you for LAUSD in terms of job participation and, and career opportunities. Yeah. Um, no, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm listening. In, in terms of finding, I think you were touching on earlier in finding opportunities to ensure that um, those from underserved communities are also um, building part of their path for careers in infrastructure development or contracting opportunities. Yeah. Well, yeah, number one, I actually appreciate being here because I'm self-serving totally self-serving because uh, what I'm doing is every conversation I'm having with people here, I'm bringing that information and having the conversations with students that, you know, tomorrow or later on this afternoon, I'll be having conversations with students and teachers and parents about what's out there. Um, you talk about, you know, kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion. LAUSD, we have it. <laughs> just like, I mean, people sometimes ask me for it. Okay, look, we need, yeah, just, talk to me, come on, we've got them, what do you need? <laughs> we've got kids who are eager and curious and we wanna help them. Um, talking about the exposure, about all the different types of uh, jobs that might be out there. So all the conversations that I've already had today, that yes, there are engineers, but there's 75 different other positions with some of these positions as well. Um, we have people who are you know, graphic artists and graphic designers, and we have people of community outreach, and we have, but and but also be just being part, part of the conversation and uh, just connecting everything together, and the exposure really is huge. Thanks very much. Um, and Erin, what initiatives does CalStart have in place to support members in creating contracting opportunities for historically underserved businesses? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, we have a lot. <laughs> Please, um, I'll be here until like six. Come by, see me, I have flyers. Um, but I, I like to take it down a level. So I know we have a lot of folks here who are working on like really big projects, you know, with the city. A lot of the things that we're trying to do is kind of like be in the middle of all of that, right? So we have a lot of small business owners, right? Um, disadvantaged business um, enterprises. And what we really try and do is strike a balance in our design between um, us deploying uh, infrastructure, but then also leaving just enough space so that people can say, okay, I can actually own this infrastructure. I can actually boost the business that I'm doing by including this um, infrastructure into my business plan. Um, and so uh, the way that we, we do that is actually more through uh, Energize, which is, as I said, our medium and heavy duty vehicle infrastructure um, program. We also have Communities in Charge, that's our light duty um, project, uh, where we really don't just talk about like where things are being deployed, but also who is also gonna be deploying this infrastructure. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy you asked that question though about membership, mm -hmm. because CalSART is a membership uh, nonprofit. We have like over 300 members. Um, and I think that we could do a better job actually of not just placing this burden on the people who are receiving the funds, but the people who are getting that information that comes from all of these programs too. Um, so I know we do it through policy a lot, mm -hmm. and then that a lot of times would go over into workforce development. And one thing that I, it's kind of like a, a hard to say, but I, I, I try and force myself to say it, um, but uh, we're asking, uh, to build a, a market and, and a workforce off of the backs of people who are already living in these areas that are overburdened, right? So let us not forget that. So anytime that we can also place ownership 
into their hands, I think is like extremely important. And that's what we really try and push for, but it, it's just so hard because it's so expensive. Yeah, I wanted to, I'm oh, sorry, Donna, I kind of beat you. <laughs> um, I wanted to also highlight one of the things that we do, I think to celebrate diversity, um, we, you know, there's a number of cultural diversity months or historical months like Black History Month, um, Asian uh, uh, Pacific, yeah, 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 American Asian Pacific Islander, thank you, um, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, what we do is one of the things that we, I, I just absolutely love that we started doing this a few years ago is because we have a number of, um, a large number of international staff that have worked on high speed rail that, that currently, that have and continue to do that. Um, we have a, a diverse population, so what we do is we highlight folks during those cultural awareness months. It's all volunteer folks that want to, um, uh, participate and so they might do a short video they might do a little historical um so maybe flash some photos of their background and then they talk about um what that me month means to them and we do it on social media because i think you know especially for those that are coming up um those those generations behind us that are still coming up this this whole see me be me situation right if they see somebody that looks like them that speaks like them that has that same cultural reference um succeeding doing something which, which I particularly think is pretty cool, just building high-speed rail, um, is being a part of that. And that could be from every aspect, not just the people that are designing it or, or the, the physical construction, but we have admin staff, we have computer scientists folks, we've got communications professionals, we've got a whole range of those folks. And so we like to celebrate that diversity of our project, but that allows us to then show um, to our student population out there Look, this is this is your future. Come be a part of it as well, and get engaged, get excited, get involved. Uh, that's that's one of the things that we also do. That I absolutely, I just one of my favorite things that we do at the authority. Yeah, also being intentional in what we do. So you mentioned so creating the partnerships and the events that we do, having students see, you know, people from the Society of Black Engineers or the National Organization of Minority Architects, but seeing themselves in certain roles, but being intentional in our recruitment and our conversations though as well. Um, women in the trades. Um, there's, <laughs> there's so much opportunity out there and dealing with misogyny. I mean, sometimes the conversations that students have, their home might be not the most welcoming place as far as some of the conversations. But yeah, you can be whatever you want to be. Like, I mean, it's not the army, but you can be, <laughs> you know, you, you can be whatever the heck you want to. There's nobody to say. Like, there's literally kids say, I, I can do that? Like, yes. There's no law against it. Like, please, you know, um, encouraging. The encouragement of, of exploration, but really the exposure and the events and, you know, meeting to not put you on the spot with too many questions, but I am going to ask you one um, question, Donald. Do you think that there's enough engagement that you're finding at LAUSD from the engineering groups and companies in the private sector to really demonstrate to the students all the opportunities that are there? There's always room for improvement. There's always room to grow. There's always room to have more conversations um, and more modeling and more events and more experiences. Um, I'm, I can stick my hand up. Yeah, I'm, I, I can grow. I can do, I can do better. Um, but I'm trying my best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, maybe to complete our panel session, I could just ask each of you, what is the one key takeaway? Maybe it's a, a key success or a lessons learned or your hope for the future um, that you'd like to leave the audience with on this subject. And um, maybe Erin, I can start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, I just want to say thanks again for the opportunity and shout out to my mom. Love you, mom. Um, now, I think that um, we want we want to have new problems. You know, like we don't want to have to say that we ha we looked at history and um, didn't change anything. Right. We have an unprecedented amount of money that is being put into this industry, as Alice said, and as everyone here has said. So um, I would say um, 
and implore everyone here to take it upon themselves to follow your interests. You know the scope of the work that you do, so that means you can't do everything, right? Equity touches everything, like transportation touches everything. But within what you can do, try and push the envelope and take it upon yourself and find some allies and partners that can help to fill in those gaps that maybe you can't. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that, and, and thanks for uh, everyone being here and listening. I guess I'll go next. Uh, there's, <coughs> there's just so much I want to say on the topic, but I think I'll, I'll sum it up with just a few words here. That just last week I was, um, I met with a, a, a researcher came into town from Germany. She's from um, DB Deutsche Bahn. And she works on the rail systems there, and she's a fellow for an American um, Council on Germany. And she was just, you know, she's doing a research project, and she asked a question. And she said, you know, what are the interiors of your train going to look like? And I just got so excited because Beverly mentioned this earlier, this outreach that we've been doing um, on our train interiors. And I said, you know, we've gone through this whole effort to ask our communities of, of every stripe, whether that be professional community, accessibility communities, cultural communities, student groups, every single, every that you can think of, every type of, 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 of group, what do you want to see on your trains? And that's just one element of this system. Stations is another example, right? What do you want to see in your stations? And we're going through a whole series of community events around that as well. But we have now, in this day and age, the opportunity to ask those questions. And I think it's becoming more and more the norm. And I've yet to hear somebody give me an argument for not doing these inclusive um, activities or, or um, uh, uh, you know, outreach efforts, you know, that it's not, a, that's not a good idea, that it's not gonna result in something better that's gonna benefit all. Um, and you do feel a sense as uh, who, when we're building infrastructure for the state of California, you feel that responsibility to ensure that it works for all of California. And through those outreach efforts, I know we're gonna get there, we're gonna get a system that is exciting for folks, that they feel, why does this feel so comfortable when I get on this? Why is this so easy to use? And that'll be a dis direct result of their voice, of their input, in the system that we're building for all. So, yeah. And I've seen the renderings of the uh, family cars. Oh, and they, cool? they look really fantastic. And it, I think it Good takes stuff. it away from everyone just sitting in their seat to yeah, exactly. the kids being able to gauge, engage with each other over the journey. Um, Donald. Well, you just put me on the spot a couple of seconds ago. It says, is LA Unified doing enough? So I guess I'm looking out now at anyone who wants to be an inspiration to students, anyone who wants to connect with students, anyone who wants to provide an internship or an apprenticeship or a job or have a conversation, talk to me. Um, look, yeah, I'll be bold. Why the hell not? You know, like, you know, it's for, it's for the benefit. It's re my job is pretty cool because I get to work with kids all the time, and it's uh, making those kind of connections. So at one point, you probably had a conversation with somebody um, who inspired you or who gave you the encouragement. Uh, you also have that opportunity, and we're trying to create those kind of opportunities for students, whatever it is they're trying to do. But the infrastructure, the potential, and the jobs, and the ability for somebody to crawl, I can't say crawl, to climb, into the upper middle class with um, just giving them the chance, giving them the opportunities, and apprenticeships, jobs, uh, conversations, all of it. So there you go. Great note to finish on, uh, a challenge for the audience, so please do connect. Um, but thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. I know it's middle of afternoon, but thank you so much, and look forward to speaking with you all after. Thank you. <laughs>